I'm James Fowler and I've translated a poem from Ancient Greek. My name is Ria Prasad and I translated a poem from Urdu. My name is Tony and I translated Duan Gersing by Cao Cao from Ancient Chinese. Hi, I'm Prajwi Thapa and I translated Farewell to Vice Prefect Du, setting out for his official post in Chu by Wang Bo from Chinese to English. My name is Ahujin Satyamurti and I translated a poem from Tamil. Hello, my name is Tarana Varma and I translated a poem from French. I chose to translate a poem from Ancient Greek because Ancient Greek poetry such as the Iliad and the Odyssey is the touchstone of modern storytelling. And I chose to translate this poem specifically because the Homeric hymns are Greek poetry that's a really important part of the Greek poetical canon, but doesn't get as much light shed on it as the Iliad and the Odyssey. Cao Cao wrote this poem at his very prime while feasting with his friends. He was inspired by the poet's profound wisdom, elegantly veiled by his heroic tone. My favourite image is when the transience of life is compared to the delicate morning dew. An interesting thing I found from this poem is the constant reference to Chinese history. For example, the reference to the Qing dynasty in line one. I think to understand this poem, you must know the feeling of letting someone go a person that you hold dear in your heart. You don't want to say goodbye, but deep in your mind, you know that's best for both of you. I chose to translate this poem because it was a war cry for India's freedom against the British, written by a young freedom fighter. The poem describes his passion, determination and patriotism to win back his motherland, which I personally found very inspiring. I think the hardest part about trying to translate this poem was conveying the deep underlying emotion as well as trying to preserve the nuances that conveyed the overall powerful message of the piece. I chose to translate this poem as it is one that talks about subjects that are not exclusive to a single person or a single community, but equality for the people across the world. The poet himself was someone who campaigned for equality between all people of different backgrounds until his untimely death in 1921 at the age of 38. I chose this poem because of how simple yet evocative it was, and I really enjoy trying to translate these qualities. I sing to Artemis, the revered virgin deer hunter, who delights in her golden arrows, clear-voiced, sister of golden-bladed Apollo. All along the airy peaks of the dark mountains, she delights in the hunt, drawing her golden bow and shooting her grievous arrows. The lofty mountaintops tremble, and the shady forests echo with the cries of the beasts, my friends, let us sing to wine, for our lives are short and sweet. Like dew on a morn divine, I long for the bygone days. Though passionately I sing, sentimental is my heart. How can our worries be freed, only with a vintage drought? Through this wall that surrounds the three chin districts, through a mist that makes five rivers one, I am filled with such sadness that we should have to part. We are two officials going opposite ways, and yet while China holds our friendship and heaven remains our neighbourhood, let us not wallow in sorrow as our paths separate and cry without hesitation like the young at home. In our hearts burns the desire for a revolution. We shall see the strength that lies in our killer's arms. I see words being thought, implied, in gatherings of silent spectators but I never see words being spoken. Why are we still quiet? I submit myself to my nation, our desperate desire to sacrifice our lives, our love for our nation. Listen to me, great mortals of whom, there are none higher or lower than each other. Where are the poor, or those who climb the mountains of affluence? Where are those lives who you call inferior? Just like you, living their inferior lives with dignity. The resounding ocean roars under the eye of a grieving moon and roars again, while a flash of lightning, brutal and sinister, splits the dusky sky with a sharp, jagged line, and every bolt and convulsive jolts shines, shouts, comes and goes along the length of the shore, while in the heavens where the storm prowls, the thunder howls formidably. Hi, my name is Tristan Willis, and I translated the poem Shele Messe by Steiner Opstad from Norwegian. My name is Eliza Spooner, and I translated Catullus IV, 
a poem by Gaius Catullus, a poet of the late Roman Republic. My name is Talia Kleinen, and I translated a poem from Italian. My name is Natalie, and I translated a poem from Spanish. Now, I really like this poem because of the complex way it deals with the topics of life and death and identity and how a person's identity and the substance of their soul can live on past their death and the meaning of all of that. What drew me to this poem was the possibility to interpret it literally as the life's journey of a ship and metaphorically as the rise and eventual fall of a great nation or of human life. I really like this poem because I think it manages to capture the calmness and beauty of an evening, particularly compared with the hectic routine of a day. The poem has natural lyricism in Italian, and I wanted to retain that sense of musicality in my translation. I found this poem really interesting because of the way the poet Antonio Machado managed to give a really vivid impression of his life, core beliefs and how he views poetry as an art form through this poem. This vessel now seen by you will declare herself as formerly the fastest of all. No challenge by any established coast was able to surpass her. Nor command of oars, nor labour of linen. She won't be denied this by the borders of the besieging Adriatic. The day was full of lightning, but now the stars will come, the unspoken stars. In the fields, there is a brief croak croak of little frogs. My childhood is a memory of a courtyard in Seville and a bright orchard where the lemon tree ripens. My youth, 20 years in the land of Castile, my history, some parts of which I would rather not remember. I have been neither a seductive manara nor a womanizer bradomin. You already know my dishevelled appearance, but I welcomed the arrow that Cupid has intended for me and loved as much as they allowed me to. Every day I take the bus by the block where John was found dead, but I don't care about that today. And at the bus stop by the church, I notice a dirty communion wafer on the asphalt, which I pick up and put in my pocket. Hi, I'm Amy and I translated a poem from German. My name is Lakey and I translated a poem from Welsh to English. Hi, my name is Olivia and I translated a poem from classical Chinese. Hi, my name is Sashi Dalmar and I translated a poem from Spanish. My name is Lawrence Drayton and I translated a poem from Latin. I'm Jamie and I translated this poem from ancient Greek as composed some 2,700 years ago. What was really interesting about translating this poem was definitely the way that it appears on the page. This is not something that we think of when we think of poetry. We think of the way that it sounds and the way that it reads. However, the poem appears entirely in free verse and lowercase letters, which definitely poses a challenge for German, which capitalises all its nouns. I chose to translate this poem because of its raw emotion and how T.H. Penny Williams was able to convey an emotion that only exists in Welsh, Hirach, a longing for home. I chose this poem because its denial of immortality is uncharacteristically bleak for Li Bai. The moon in the poem recalls ancient Chinese legends, which describe how humans used to be able to pass through stages of death and rebirth according to the moon's cycles, a power which none have been able to retrieve. I really like this poem because I think it really beautifully captures the way media and forms of entertainment such as a soap opera can distract us from the mundane nature of life by hooking us into a plot line and then we are brought right back down to earth um, after the end of an episode. It gives a fascinating insight into the ancients' views of their gods. I've translated it into alliterative verse, meaning it has a varied metre, but the alliteration in the stressed feet of each line give it some structure. Being so old, its author isn't known, and indeed the version we now have was probably altered and amended by many poets throughout the Greek world. I picked this part of the Metamorphoses because I was really interested by the combination of body horror and the metaphors and something that was quite beautiful. I was also really interested by the theme of bodily autonomy, the fact that nothing really along this process is something that Daphne has chosen, but it happens anyway. Earlier we lifted it from the meadows with pitchforks, spades, 
Rosy snout and burrowing, unsoiled paws, soft skin which plowed through meadows. Then there were the metal rods which stabbed into the soil for sound waves, a clear rhythm meant to drive the animals from their tunnels. Because it has no direct translation. And this makes the poem so meaningful and able to relate to anyone. It was only the desert harshness of a trueless world around my birth in Far Snowdonia. As if giants had always existed though, smoothing the slopes with each hand. And throughout my upbringing, with amazement of my boyhood in our high home, the old form of these mountains pressed until they went from their boldness into my essence. Sing me, O muse of the son of the herald, two hooves, two horns, in hubbub he revels, in fields and forests he frolics with nymphs, while on boulders he treads both barren and high, giving prayers up to Pan, the pastoral god, of the long unkempt locks who lives on the crests. The living are wayfarers drifting through, the dead have all gone home. Our journey from heaven to earth is a brief crossing in defiance of the wretched constancy that waits, ancient, eternal, forsaken, dust for 10,000 years. Homer left this place empty, this spot which Shehazarad occupied, or before the invention of language, the place at which tribes people congregated to listen to the fire is now taken up by the big stupid box. Siblings forget their squabbles and hang out on the same sofa. Both mistress and servant renounce their differences in class, and now they are something more than equal. They are allies. The girl turns pale, her strength sapped by flight. She is conquered by her suffering. She watches the streaming father waves of Peneus and cries out, Father, help me. If there is still any god left in these waters, destroy the lines of this lovely body, change me, 